first Spine Society meeting, and hopefully this is going to be our cornerstone in future collaboration between the AO Spine and the Saudi Spine Society. I was asked to present on trauma in the uh, ankylocervical spine. First, I have nothing to disclose. I'm starting with an index case. Uh, this is a 55-year-old male, fell backwards getting out of a car, landing on his back. And he brought the ambulance by emergency uh, to emergency department within three hours of injury. So this is a fairly short distance and time between the injury and presentation. He was hemodynamically stable. He was complaining of diffuse pain over his back as well as his neck. Neurological uh, 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 symptoms was describing numbness, tingling in both arms and legs. Upper and lower extremities examination showed that he had two to three uh, over five in major myotomes. And you can see here from the left as well as the right, he has uh, both injuries of the cervical as well as the thoracolumbar spine. You can see very uh, significant injury over the C5, C6 uh, levels. And this is a very nice, obvious uh, MRI finding that corresponds with the initial CT scans, both in the cervical spine as well as the thoracolumbar spine. We're going to go into the uh, surgical management as well as what was done for this patient later on in, this, in the talk. So, as I mentioned earlier, the talk is on ankylosing spondylitis as well as the uh, DISH. Epidemiology of ankylosing spondylitis is a well-described subtype of seronegative uh, spondyloarthropathy. The incidence is reported to be between 0.5 and 14 per 100,000 people per year. The prevalence is between 0.1 and 1.4 within men, and they are affected as twice as female, so male more than female and has done so before the age of 30 in more than 80% of the cases. And on the contrary, which I'm gonna present and uh, elaborate more later, uh, later on is DISH, which is more in the elderly population. So what's more peculiar about ankylosing spondylitis? Uh, the rigidity of spine creates difference, or different biomechanical situations than the one normal in mobile spine. So that's why they are different and there's a long lever arm results in issues similar to the management of long bone fractures. People in this, uh, here in the audience with an orthopedic background understand what this means. Increased risk of neurological compromise, especially epidural hematoma, is very distinctive of uh, ankylosing spondylitis, as well as non-union. There are often extension type fractures due to fixed flexion deformity, and 15 to 20 percent of delayed diagnosis. Why? About half of their the patients, they have failure to diagnose as and presentation, and the reminder to delayed presentation. So they don't present earlier as our index case, which uh, was three hours after. 70% present with neurological compromise. So as I mentioned, the loss of spinal mobility, extension first, reduced chest expansion, this is another problem. Ocular inflammation in one third of the cases that those patients present with. They also present with cardiac and pulmonary complications, which should be taken into consideration whenever we treat these patients surgically. And they have progressive spinal deformity. So diagnosis of ang spawn, they have to have low back pain for more than three months, pain stiffness in the thorax, limited chest expansion, limited lumbar motion, past or present iritis, as well as radiological sacroiliitis, and last is radiological syndesmophytes. But what is the key landmark uh, of ankylosing spondylitis is the presence of the ossification of the ligaments. So we need four of the five clinical criteria and the radiological criteria plus one other. What about DISH? Disseminated idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. Again, male pred uh, predominance, more advanced age as compared to ankylosing spondylitis, typically affect the thoracic spine as opposed to the ankylosing spondylitis, which affects more the cervical spine. Here, it's the least involved uh, compared to thoracic and lumbar. Coincidence with the comorbidities, including pulmonary hypertension, neuropathy, including end organ disease, such as diabetes, elevated systemic inflammatory proteins, and advanced obesity. Ossification occurs essentially in the anterior longitudinal ligaments, and minimally involves the paravertebral connective tissue. So the diagnostic criteria of DISH was laid down by Forcier. The key radiological difference, which everybody should understand and know is between the DISH and ANG spawn, it lies with the absence of involvement of sacroiliac joint, 
which is in Angspawn, and a paucity of joints in DISH, and the absence of involvement of the cranial cervical joints. Also, there is no syndesmal pipe formation in DISH. The fracture line in DISH typically passes through the vertebral body in the majority of the cases, in contrast to di uh, ankylosing spondylitis, where it only passes through the former disc space. What about radiological investigations? We should not only, or we should not only depend on uh, plain x-rays. In general, both CT scans and MRI with previously mentioned neurological compromise should be done and recommended as a primary investigation of choice when po possibly dealing and identifying spinal injuries in patients with DISH as well as ankylosing spondylitis. There's few special consideration whenever we are dealing with ang spawn and uh, DISH. Transferring patient to a medical facility can be precarious as a conventional recovery strategy, strategy with neck collars in supine position or rigid backbone or backboard may cause secondary displacement of the fracture, so they should not be used. Osteoporosis will impair implant purchase, so whenever dealing with those patient categories, we should think of the bone quality and how can we deal with that. Traditional anatomic and radiographic landmarks needed for safe implant placement may be distorted, or actually sometimes they are absent. The bone and soft tissue tend to bleed significantly in those patients and form epidural hematoma, as I mentioned earlier, with ankylosing spondylitis. So surgical or treatment in general is divided into surgical and non-surgical. Briefly on non-surgical, rarely recommended. For all, but can be considered, as I said, can be considered in non-displaced and clinically stable patients. So very small percentage of patients with angst bone as well as dish cervical spine fractures. Secondary fracture displacement in injuries more unstable than anticipated and patient intolerance to bracing are common reasons for the reported high failure rate with non-surgical treatment of almost 50%. So surgical treatment. The most often cited reason for surgical intervention are one, neurological deterioration, presence of unstable fracture, three is detection of epidural hematoma. Those are the main three reasons mentioned in the literature. Use of a halo vest assembly for cervical fracture is problematic, as you heard Dr. Tropiano mention earlier with uh, dense fracture. Because of advanced age, cervical thoracic kyphosis more peculiar to our patient category, and absent compliance with the frozen chest wall, which can lead to increased risk of aspiration, pulmonary deterioration due to mobility of their chest wall. So it should not be considered. What about traction? Preoperative traction can be applied, as mentioned in the literature, but we have to pay attention to the direction of traction should be aligned with the normal cervical curvature before the fracture. So you don't put it where it's supposed to, you should put it where it was before the injury. The weight of the traction should be appropriately reduced. So according to the literature, the, the maximum or the range used is between two to five kgs, not more than that. Okay, since we're talking about surgical management, we always talk about is it anterior, posterior, or anterior and posterior, 360 combined approach. So what does the literature say about posterior approach? Commonly chosen surgical technique for stabilization for subaxial spine fracture. It decreases the lever arm acting on the fracture segment and also permits some deformity correction. So go long to prevent the lever arm problems. What about anterior approach? Most of us is familiar more with anterior approach. Should we go there? It's less trauma as compared to the posterior approach. Complete decompression of anterior column which serves the purpose sometimes. Anterior column gap has an op when it's open during fracture reduction on posterior fixation and decompression can be needed sometimes to be filled with secondary, with bone graft with secondary anterior procedures if adequate. So you can complement your posterior with an anterior if you have a significant gap anteriorly. But you have to pay attention significantly on osteoporosis. So if you're going anterior alone sometimes, your purchase is not gonna be good enough, especially knowing that you're only fixing what's supposed to be an anterior and mid column, so the posterior column or a tension band can basically fail you and you have a failure of reduction. You have to be very careful and be aware of displacement that can happen with anterior 
fixation only. What about the combined 360 approach? Recommended for unstable injuries with translation or defects of the anterior column with additional cathodic deformity. Surgery should begin primarily from the side where the fracture can be best reduced, usually from anterior. Fracture type and the patient general condition would determine one time or stage surgery. So either to, to do anterior and posterior in the same setting, or you can stage it. Anterior, then posterior, then anterior, or vice versa. Posterior approach, specific concerns. And this is very, very, very important. I cannot stress this uh, slide more than what I'm gonna say right now. Patient positioning. During the turning maneuvers that we use in our daily uh, surgery, surgical practice, fracture displacement can readily occur even with e exacting or exact technique. Turning table, without mentioning company's name, that you can use that for unstable fracture may not be suitable for this kind of patients. And formal multi-person turn aided by neurophysiological monitoring and imaging may be preferable. I can see the last is neural evoked potential is used for this purpose before and after positioning to make sure that, that nothing happened and you did not lose any, any, any uh, action potentials. The alternative consists of more limited anterior approach with a plate fixation, short, provide temporary buttress before turning to prone position into a posterior surgery. So this is a very important slide that everybody deals with, dish or angst bone specifically, cervical spine fracture should take into consideration. Okay, so going back to our index surgery, our index case, you can see here uh, um, a significant fracture through the C5, C6, and you can see the corresponding MRI image on the right side. And what was done for this patient is all posterior, open posterior C2 all the way to T3, fusion, which is a long fusion, as I mentioned earlier, just to prevent any failure, long lever arm, with C4 to C5 laminectomy because of this patient neurological compromise pre-op and to prevent any further epidural hematomas in the future. What about take home message? This is a complex injury, whether we deal with DISH or ang swan Beware of segmental fractures, even in low energy trauma, which most of this patient present after. Beware of late neurological deterioration, especially with cervical injuries and potential for epidural hematoma. Consider positioning challenge ahead of time. Unless there's a medical complication or comorbidities, stabilization is usually indicated as the first line of treatment. Instrument long to account for biomechanical stress over long, veer, long lever arms and osteoporosis. Patients with angst spawn, often unstable, have a greater risk of non-union and epidural hematomas, as mentioned. Thank you.